Uh, well, good evening. Why don't we begin? My name is Mark Nelson. I know some of you. Uh, for those of you I don't know, I'm Professor of Philosophy here at Westmont, uh, and my job is to welcome you to tonight's lecture and also to introduce our speaker. Um, our speaker has been invited to campus to receive, this is a mouthful, the 2018 Book Award from the Dallas Willard Research Center and Martin Institute at Westmont College. Uh, he's going to receive his award tomorrow morning in chapel convocation, and uh, if you're at chapel tomorrow, you can hear him speak then. But we've also asked him to uh, give uh, the, share the fruits of his research with us tonight in a separate lecture. Uh, but first, before I introduce him, let me give you a little context. Um, so, there is this thing called the Martin Institute for <laughs> Christianity and Culture. Within the Martin Institute, there is the Dallas Willard Center, uh, which um, is dedicated to the job of promoting and uh, uh, spreading the legacy of Christian philosopher and writer Dallas Willard, who had a special uh, passion in addition to his academic philosophical work uh, for uh, understanding authentic spiritual and moral transformation. And the Dallas Willard Book Award initiative is one way that the Martin Institute and the Dallas Willard Center are working to promote uh, and recognize exemplary scholarship on those areas that were of special interest to Dallas Willard. Thanks to generous support from Patty and F. Martin who are with us this evening. Uh, the book awards are now in their fourth year and so I would like to thank the Martins, along with the Gady Institute and the uh, Provost's Office for supporting this lecture. Can we um, just take a moment to thank the Martins and the Provost and the Gady <laughs> Now, I'm happy to announce that this year's award winner is Dr. Mark R. McMinn for his 2018 book, The Science of Virtue, why Positive Psychology Matters to the Church. Uh, Mark McMinn received his undergraduate degree uh, <clears throat> from Lewis and Clark College with a double major in psych psychology and chemistry. He received a PhD in clinical psychology from Vanderbilt University. He taught at George Fox University from 1984 to 1993 before leaving to help start the PsyD, <coughs> P-S-Y-D, program at Wheaton College, where he later held an endowed chair. He returned to George Fox in 2006 and now serves as professor and director of faith integration in the Graduate School of Clinical Psychology. He's a licensed psychologist in Oregon, author or co-author of 12 books, editor or co-editor of at least four more, creator of 18 pieces of software, and author or co-author of over 150 journal articles and book chapters. I actually just stopped counting at 150. Mark is married to Lisa Graham McMinn, who's a sociologist, speaker, and writer, and uh, together they run a small sustainable farm where they grow fruits and vegetables, tend chickens, and keep honeybees. Mark told me today that the most exciting thing he's doing right at the moment, the thing he derives most satisfaction from, is building a goat barn. Um, Mark McMinn's academic work has spanned a number of fields within psychology, but these days he works primarily in that frontier land between psychology, moral philosophy, and Christian theology in what has come to be known as positive psychology. Now, I expect you're going to hear something about that tonight, but before we do, let me mention something that may help to put his achievement uh, in this book into perspective. Forty years ago, a book like The Science of Virtue, Why Positive Psychology Matters to the Church, could not have been written. Uh, it could not have been written because of antagonism between um, two sides to the very idea of Christian psychology. From the side of scientific psychology, the idea that an intelligent, educated person could be an orthodox professing Christian was just unthinkable. I once heard of a Lutheran in the psychology department at the University of Minnesota in the late 50s, early 60s, 
who was driven to the conclusion that the most he could hope to accomplish was to show his secular colleagues that Christians actually wore shoes. <laughs> his words. Um, but the antagonism from Christians to psychology um, is at least as strong. Uh, some of you will know the Christian pa the pastor and Christian writer and psychologist John Ortberg. He and I were classmates. My first year in graduate school in philosophy, he was in first year of graduate school in psychology at Fuller. We decided to drive cross country to his place in California. We overnighted in Kansas at the home of my aunt, uh, my mother's sister who had married a Mennonite farmer. Hard-working, salt-of-the-earth people, uneducated, graduated high school and nothing more. Um, uh, 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 hands as big as shovels <laughs> from uh, working a farm and driving tractors and doing everything that farmers do. Sitting around the dinner table, um, with a hospitable meal, my uncle turned to me and said, Mark, now what is it you're studying? It's not philosophy, is it? I said, <clears throat> well, I'm afraid it is, Uncle Lee. And he had the look of pain came over his face, but then, you know, he shrugged and said, well, that happens, I suppose. Could have been worse, could have been psychology. <laughs> <laughs> he turned to John and said, what is it you study? <laughs> and this is indicative, I think, of uh, where the relations between Christianity and psychology were when Mark McMinn really started his academic research. But things have changed, and I think maybe we will hear a little bit tonight about how and why. Um, so please join me in welcoming our 2018 Book Award winner, Mark McMinn. Thank you so much. This is, uh, this is a distinct honor, and I'm, I'm really privileged to be here. I, I just wanted to start by um, telling, just saying a word about what an honor this is. I, it all came, I, I, it's been an honor ever since I found out about this several years ago, or several months ago when Dr. Nelson emailed me. But today, I walked back on this campus where I actually attended for one year back in the late 1970s, and all these memories started just come, just flooded me and I, I felt so grateful. There was a biologist by the name of Dr. Frank Percival and I looked him up this afternoon and discovered he just retired a couple years ago. He had a, a, had a really profound influence on me in the one class I took. And, and, and then I'm also just so grateful for the work of Dallas Willard and, and, and the institute that's been established here. Um, there are a number of his books, Dr. Willard's books, that were influential for me, but one of the early ones was a book called The Spirit of the Disciplines. Uh, such an important book for me, and, one of, and, and there are lots of reasons why, uh, and I'll mention a little bit about this in chapel in a different direction, but, but one of the things that, that, that was so meaningful to me about that book was, we, we talk so much in, in Christian colleges about the life of the mind, but there's also the life of the body, and he, he talked about in that book how the spiritual life is embodied, that, that there's something about, you can't think of a spiritual discipline that doesn't involve the body. And it really gave me um, a sort of freedom to think about the life of the body. And I was talking with my wife on the phone last night, uh, and I was saying I'm probably the only one staying at the Montecito Inn tonight that started his day by spending 90 minutes digging a ditch in the morning, which is what was great fun for me, because I am working on this goat barn, and we have to draw, uh, put an irrigation line in. And, um, I just love the sort of embodied nature of what it means to be human. It's been, it's been so important to me. I also want to say a word of thanks to the John Templeton Foundation. Uh, they funded the research that you'll be hearing me talk about. I also want to say it's just a little bit daunting to be a research psychologist uh, receiving an award that, uh, from a man who is a brilliant philosopher, and there's many philosophers in this room tonight, and I've always found philosophers just a little bit intimidating because they're so smart. And I'm just going to talk about science, but I'll, I'll try to sort of uh, do that in a way that's not too disrespectful to the complexity of, of the issues. I want to start with a mystery graph. Um, this ranges from 1980 to, to 2014, and our job is to sort of figure out what it is that we're graphing here. Someone recently got, uh, guessed Apple stock, uh, 
it's not that. <laughs> um, but I want to sort of use the, the graph to kind of give you a few markers along the way, and, and Dr. Nelson already uh, implied some of what I'm going to talk about, starting with 1980. Now, many of you weren't born in 1980, but I was. I was just finishing undergraduate, and I was on my way to Vanderbilt University. Um, this, was, this was the year in the Pacific Northwest where I lived that Mount St. Helens blew. I remember the day after I graduated from college, there was an inch of ash uh, all over the Portland area. It looked almost like snow, but really fine powder. This was the year that the Rubik's Cube uh, was the best-selling Christmas gift. I think it cost $1.99. Uh, it was also the year, now it was actually a few years uh, before this, but this was the year that two um, people in my church, whom I respected a great deal, read a book called The Psychological Way, The Spiritual Way. And I just finished college, I was, I was married. Actually, that's what took me away from Westmont. I, 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 I'll talk about this in chapel a little bit. I loved Westmont, but I also was in love. And my, this was before Facebook and email, or yeah, before um, FaceTime and email. So the only way to be close to this woman I loved was to move back to Portland where she lived. And we just celebrated 40 years of marriage, so I guess it was a good choice. <laughs> But that's what took me back to, to Portland. And we, so we attended church in Portland, and we, we were on our way to Tennessee, where I was going to start my graduate work. And this concerned couple in our church came up, and they said, we're concerned that if you go study psychology, you're going to lose your faith. And they had just read this book. Um, the, the interesting thing was we decided to go ahead and go. With these, this couple, we really did respect them. It, was a, it actually made the choice a bit difficult for us, but we went ahead and went. Uh, the first day I showed up on Vanderbilt's campus, it was, we were at a cohort of six people in this doctoral program in, in clinical psychology, and one of my cohort members heard my story, and she looked at me and she said, what? You're, gonna, you're religious and you're going to be a psychologist? That's not possible. You can't be both religious and be a psychologist. So here I had it from two angles, one from my church, one from this uh, colleague at, at graduate school, both of them saying, you can't do this. You can't be a psychologist and be a committed Christian. So this has been sort of the life adventure professionally, and, and, and it's really remarkable to see how it's changed. So that's 1980. 1998, this was the year that um, Martin Seligman was president of the American Psychological Association, and every president, he's president for one year, every president uh, comes up with a presidential initiative. And Dr. Seligman's initiative for that year was to bring this idea of positive psychology into more prominence. Positive psychology had actually been around since about 1960, but the idea was, let's make it more prominent. And, and Seligman had this to say, he said, in our fields, we've done a, a reasonably good job looking at mental illness, suffering, victims, depression, anger, and so forth. But we've done pretty poorly with looking at mental health, looking at positive emotion, engagement, purpose, positive relationships, positive accomplishment. We need to spend more time on what goes right with people and not what goes wrong with people. And so this is when positive psychology became actually quite prominent just about 20 years ago. So let's put that on the graph, 1998. Well, this is a graph on the scientific articles on the topic of forgiveness. Uh, and you see what happens. So, um, here we have very little, and then positive psychology gets birthed, and suddenly we have a lot of interest in a topic like forgiveness. Forgiveness, fundamentally, is a moral concept. It's a religious concept, if you will. And now the scientists are getting interested in it. And the interesting thing happened then is Christian scholars started showing up in mainstream psychology journals. I would say, so from 1980, when I was told you can't do this, I would say the vast majority of journal articles that I read these days are written by Christians, partly because I'm reading mostly in the positive psychology literature. Things have changed so much in the last 40 years, it's absolutely remarkable. This is what I'm calling the science of virtue. It's the science of positive psychology. So what I want to suggest, um, that what I'm really wanting to focus on tonight is the subtitle though. It's why this matters to the church. And I want to suggest four reasons. 
the second reason I'm going to give you is going to take longer than the others. So when you get, when I start getting into the second reason, you're going to start looking at your watch and thinking, does he know that he's taking a long time? Yes, I know that. The third and the fourth will kind of move pretty quickly. Um, but these four reasons are the ones I want to suggest to you why positive psychology matters to the church. The first one is simply to reclaim a language of virtue. I told you I'm not a philosopher, I don't understand philosophy very well, but the first thing I did when writing this book is I went and I found a philosopher that I thought I needed to read, and indeed I did. This is a book by Alistair McIntyre called After Virtue. One of my philosophy colleagues at George Fox has referred to this as one of the most important books in moral philosophy in the last half of the 20th century. So I, I knew when he said that, I've got to pay attention here. Uh, and I, not being a philosopher, I'm not trying to do justice to the sort of deep philosophical work here. I'm going to give you sort of a popularized summary of what I took away from this idea of after virtue. McIntyre makes the point that we don't live in a social context where we can understand virtue very well anymore. So Aristotle and following, you know, we, hear, we, we, we understand that there are different social contexts where virtues were explored and discovered, but today we don't live in that social context where we can understand it particularly well. So um, the notion of telos, so, uh, or a sense of becoming our full self, as, uh, our fullness of humanity is what we, we, we seem to have lost, is what McIntyre says, and without a notion of telos, a sense of end, not end like the terminus, not like the end of life, but end in terms of what we are created to be, our fullness. That's what we've lost. So you think about something like, like um, Psalm, 1, Psalm 1, the beginning of, of, this, of the Hebrew songbook, and, and, and we see this notion of telos right there. Those who delight in God's ways are like trees planted along the river bank, bearing fruit each season. Their, li their leaves never wither, and they prosper in all they do. And, and we see embedded in that a notion of what it means to be fully human. And that's, it, I, I, as, as Dr. Nelson mentioned, we have this little farm, so we grow things. So this is a bean. And you wouldn't expect to put a bean seed in the soil and have a carrot come up. It's going to be a bean. It's what a, a bean is created to be in, a, in its fullness. A bean is an amazing thing. It produces so many more beans, right? That's, think about telos in that sense, about who we are created to be. <clears throat> I want to kind of use four different ways of looking at this idea that we've lost a notion of telos, and therefore we've lost an understanding of virtue. Uh, and I'm going to do this by kind of looking at some popular um, literature and, 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 and things. But one of the first way, the first way I want to look at this is sort of what is a virtue? What do we understand a virtue to be? If, uh, if you've heard David Brooks, he's a, he's a New York Times columnist, and he's written this book called The Road to Character, which is a book about humility. But he starts his book in this most intriguing way by making a distinction between eulogy and resume virtues. So um, let, me, let me show you some examples. These are some things that might show up uh, when you describe a person. Some of them would be things that would show up on a resume. Some of them are things that might show up at a memorial service or a funeral. And you can look at that list, and you could probably pretty quickly distinguish between the two. You could sort them out so that you could say, OK, the ones on the left, those are sort of the resume virtues. And the ones on the right, those are the things that are going to show up at a memorial service, things that you'd say about a person. And, and, and one of the points that Brooks makes in his book, and I think it's very consistent with the point McIntyre's making in After Virtue, is we tend to live in a culture where we focus much more on resume virtues than we do on eulogy virtues. We focus on the marketplace, what the values of the marketplace are, much more than on telos, what, what we're kind of created to be in our fullness. So that's one, one way to sort of look at this. The second way, and, and, and I'm taking some liberties here, but let's just ask the question, who is Jesus? 
Okay, and I'm going to go to that verse in John 1 that Karl Barth would say is the very center of Scripture, John 1.14. And I'm, I'm, don't do this at home, but I'm making up some scripture verses here. Okay, so, so here's one. So the word became human and made his home among us. He became an excellent carpenter. Now, that in fact is true. Uh, Justin Martyr is a second century apologist who actually wrote about the plows that Jesus of Nazareth made that were still around in the second century. Jesus was, in fact, an excellent carpenter. Can you imagine making a wooden plow that's around you know, that many years later. It's phenomenal. But that's not what Scripture records here. That would be more what we would say today in a, in a time where we don't really think about eulogy virtues as much as we think about resume virtues, right? So the Word became human and made His home among us. He became leader of the world's largest religion. Again, that would be true. But... And it's maybe what we would say today, but it's not what John records. This verse of scripture, this, this sort of great turning point of all history, this is what John records. The word became human and made his home among us, and he was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. He was full of grace and truth. And those are the characteristics of Jesus that in that time, were celebrated, the, 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 the telos of who Jesus was. It's not what we would emphasize today necessarily. I'm getting a little sillier as we go here, but let me think about board games with you. We, uh, we all know the world of board games, and certainly they must say something about what we value as a people. If you, if you have to move in a board game from point A to point B, and you win if you get to point B soonest, that must say something about what we value, about what it means to be successful in a life. Speaking of life, uh, there's a board game, and there are certain ways that you get from point A to point B, right? And I don't recall all the details. I know it involves having like little children in your car and different pathways and different career paths. And you get to the end, and if you're at Millionaire Acres, it's much better than if you're in the poor farm. I remember these details about it, but it shows something about how we understand progressing through a life. Or the game of Monopoly shows something about what we value in, in progressing through life. Shoots and ladders, as far as I can tell, is just about dumb luck. I, I'm not sure what that's about. <laughs> My daughter and I, I'm embarrassed to admit this, the rest of our family, um, I have three daughters, and my wife and the other two kids would play these sort of wholesome games like word games, and my daughter and I would instead play this game Acquire, and I look back on it now and I feel kind of embarrassed because it was all about putting someone out of business so that you could make more money, and it. it's kind of like the values that, what was I teaching my daughter? She's doing okay. Um, but. So then I was thinking, well, what if we had a game like this? We call it the game of virtue. And the way you move from point A and po to point B is you demonstrate kindness and humility and love. And that's sort of what, what happens at the end. There, there's no winner or loser. That's just the goal, to become more humble and loving and kind. And you say to me, and you're right, no one would ever buy that game. And it's absolutely true. And I think we're starting to understand McIntyre's point when we see that, that this is not interesting to people. It's not the way we think. It's not the way we live. It's not engaging to us. Because we don't live in a time where telos is the way we think about what it means to be human. We live in the marketplace instead. Or how about this? Um, Ask an uh, eight-year-old, what do you want to be when you grow up? I actually have data on this. This is what the top responses for girls are. In 2015, it might be a little different now. This is the top responses for boys. If I were a Christian college president, I'd be a little nervous about boys uh, as I look at that list. But this is what we see. Wouldn't it be interesting to ask an eight-year-old, what do you want to be when you grow up? And to hear, when I grow up, I want to be incredibly resilient and strong. I want to be kind. I want to be loving. Again, we don't hear that. It's almost unimaginable that we would hear that because we don't live in a time where we think about these things. 
I, I, I mentioned this to a group uh, a few months ago, and someone came up to me afterwards, and she had a son, and when she asked him what he wanted to be when he grew up, he was, he was three, so he's well before eight. He said, I want to be a puppy dog when I grow up. And she said, well, what kind of puppy dog do you want to be? And he said, I want to be a kind puppy. Uh, that's beautiful. That's, that's, I mean, you know, at three and eight, you see a difference, but that's, that's this notion of sort of telos. What might telos look like in our educational institution, in our counseling office, in our places of worship, if we thought about what it means to be fully and wholly human in, in light of virtue? All right. So that's kind of my first point, that one of the reasons positive psychology matters to the church is because it helps us reclaim something that we've lost. We've really lost it as a society, and that's the, nat the, the language of virtue. The second reason is it helps us enhance the very constructs. Positive psychology was birthed, actually, by looking through religious traditions and figuring out what sort of virtues were in the religious traditions, and then taking the religion out of them so that they could be studied scientifically. But my question is, can we bring the faith back? Can we bring the religion back into those concepts? And, and if we do, I think we'll come up with stronger, <coughs> richer, more vibrant constructs. So I want to illustrate this with forgiveness and gratitude and humility, all of which are being studied in positive psychology. We live in this time, this is a, a a graphic I found kind of interesting. It's, uh, we live in a time that David Brooks calls the big me. There's just a lot of focus on, on ourselves, right? On, on, on the big me. He illustrates this by, uh, by looking at some Gallup poll data. He asked high school seniors in 1960, this was a, a Gallup poll question in 1960, are you a very important person? At that point, 12% of high school seniors said yes to the question. In 2005, the Gallup organization asked the same question to high school seniors, and 80% said yes to that question. Now, perhaps that's a positive change. I'm not arguing that that's a bad thing, but it is a thing. It's a thing that's changed significantly over time, the idea that I am important, and there's a lot more focus on the self than there was in times gone pat by. The, the point I want to suggest here, and it's a bit controversial, but I'll, I'll just sort of assert it and then try to illustrate it, is left to itself, psychology tends to sort of drift or drive toward self-interest, sort of focus on, on the big me, on the self. And I think we've done that even in positive psychology with things like forgiveness and gratitude and humility. Now the church, in contrast to that, the church has always stood for something different than the big me. You know, Jesus, some religious leaders, they, they came to Jesus and they tried to trick him. And they said, what's the most important of all the commandments? And Jesus gave this answer that has been resounding through all the centuries. He says, the most important thing is to love God with your whole self and to love your neighbor as yourself. And that's what the church throughout the centuries has stood for. And that is different than this drift toward self-interest. It's a, it's a pull, it's a draw toward love of God and other, love of God and neighbor. And so we need that to help complement this sort of drift toward self-interest. And that's the case I want to make as we look at these, at these virtues. Sort of this tension between the big me and the, and the role that the church has always played. So let's look at forgiveness. Um, there, is, there are well over 2,000 studies now on the topic of forgiveness. You saw the graph, and, and it's just continued to go up. There's so many studies on forgiveness. Um, this is a book I have not read beyond the introduction. It may be a very fine book, but I, I was struck by the introduction on this sort of the big me in terms of how it focused everything on, on the self. So what is forgiveness? Uh, it's the peace you learn to feel when you allow these circling planes to land. It's for you. It's not for the offender. It's taking back your power. It's taking responsibility for how you feel. Now, by the way, I want to say, I, I realize I'm venturing into very sort of 
difficult, challenging territory because forgiveness is a very painful topic for so many. I'm not making light of this. I actually think there's some value in self-interested forgiveness. But I just want to illustrate how the popular literature around this has become so focused on the self-interested part of forgiveness that we may tend to overlook some other parts of it. Um, we now know from the scientific literature that if you forgive, it will improve your blood pressure, you have better cholesterol, I can go down this whole list, your immunity you're gonna, will be better, you have less depression. There's even a recent study that shows after you've forgiven someone, you can jump a little bit higher than you could before. It increases your vertical leap to, to forgive. I mean, there's all kinds of benefits to forgiveness. And these, again, these, are, these should be celebrated. These are good things. I'm not being critical of this. But you see how if we start getting enough information about how good it is to forgive someone for us, for ourselves, how that can become the focus then of why we would forgive. And that's where we need the church to remind us that we are called <coughs> to love God and neighbor. Right in the middle of the Lord's Prayer is this passage about forgive, forgiveness. Forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And so I'm drawn to the work of, of, of a theologian and a, and a, and a, and a Christian activist. Uh, <coughs> Greg Jones has been at uh, Duke and at Baylor, I'm not sure where he is now. I think he may st be back at Duke now. From, but, but, but he's a theologian. He's been very critical of the psychology literature on forgiveness. He's written some books on forgiveness himself. Celestin Musakura is one of his former students who is the founder of Alarm Ministries in Rwanda, where he, has, he actually lost a, a number of family members in the Rwandan genocide. And he's developed this ministry to help Rwandans work through the very difficult, painful, long process of forgiveness. I love this book. He's critical of psychology, but he brings us back to what forgiveness looks like in the church. And look at the title. That's the essence of it, right? To forgive as we have been forgiven. That's the center of the Lord's Prayer. This is not just about self-interest. It's not just about lowering our blood pressure and jumping higher. This is about living out of the fullness of, for, of forgiving as we have been forgiven, living into our telos as those who have been forgiven. It's a beautiful reminder of what the church has always stood for. So what can the church offer positive psychology? Well, when it comes to forgiveness, I think we have to acknowledge that the church can help us sort of with this imbalance. Uh, uh, there's thousands of articles, as I mentioned, at least a couple thousand on forgiveness. There's probably only a handful on seeking forgiveness. They're all about forgiving the person that hurt us and not about seeking forgiveness when we've hurt the other. Why is that? Why, why are we all hurt, but none of us are hurting? It just doesn't, the, the universe doesn't balance if you think about it that way. But the church reminds us that We've all been forgiven. We all are hurters. We all are the ones that offend as well as those who have been hurt. That's an important corrective, I think. We've been so deeply forgiven. Here's another thing. If you look at, if you look at the psychology literature, the psychologists will say, and I'm one of them, I'm a psychologist, but we tend to say forgiveness and reconciliation are utterly different things. So like if someone is in an abusive relationship, you might forgive the person that hurt you, but don't go back. That doesn't make any sense to go back and get hurt over and over again. And I, th I think we're right about that. I think we need to hold some separation. But the theologians, including Greg Jones, will say it's not quite that simple. It's, you can't cleanly separate them as easily as the psychologists want to do. I, I love what they do in this book, Forgiving as We've Forgiven. They say, they say, okay, you can't always reconcile. Sometimes there's just no way to go back. Maybe your offender's dead. You can't reconcile with that person. But what you can do is you can get in touch with this deep inner yearning for reconciliation. You can at least get in touch with that longing to be reconciled, even if it doesn't make sense to ever be reconciled. And I love that. I think, I think a sort of Christian understanding of forgiveness enriches the concept. 
Gratitude. Let me mention gratitude as another thing where the church can be of, of great benefit. You ever have days like this where you just feel like you're about to explode? Um, there's interesting research on stress. There, there's a lot of negative consequences to the big stressors in life, but, but the stressors that really get to us in terms of health effects are the little ones. Things like losing your keys every day. Uh, or um, misplacing things, or, or ha just having too much to do, or weight concerns. These are the things that actually have the sort of daily health consequences more than the big things. And you, you probably have days where you just wish there could be kind of a reset button, where you could just sort of, just sort of start over. This is what gratitude is. It's a chance to just sort of stop and start over. So I want to tell you about a study, a, a study that sort of rocked the world in 2003. Um, you may have heard of gratitude journaling. It's, it's a concept that's pretty common these days. It was actually developed by Bob Emmons, who's a Christian scholar at UC Davis, for this study that I'm about to tell you about. Uh, and this is what, uh, so they had UC Davis students. There were actually three different studies. I'm going to tell you about the first one and a little bit about the second one. But they had UC Davis students randomly assigned, and that's going to be important. I'll come back to why random assignment's important randomly assigned to one of three groups. And one group was the gratitude journaling group, where once or more a week they were asked to keep a gratitude journal, and these were the, these were the instructions that they were given for how to go about journaling gratitude. Now the other two groups, one of them kept a journal about hassles, the things that were sort of bugging them in life, the nagging things, the hassles. And then the third was just keeping a con uh, journal about just daily events, what was going on in their life. They followed these students up for nine weeks, uh, and then after that as well. And what they found, some things are pretty predictable. They found that the people in the gratitude group were more, they had more favorable life ratings than either the hassles or the events group. Now this is where um, random assignment becomes important, because in, in the social sciences or natural sciences for that matter, if you do random assignment, you can actually infer cause and effect. So we can say that the gratitude journaling actually caused people to be more favorable about their life ratings. That's not too surprising. They were more optimistic. The gratitude group felt more optimistic. But here's where it started to rock the world now. And again, remember, we can infer cause and effect here. But what they found is the students who practiced gratitude actually had less physical illness. They went to the doctor less than people in the other group. They, um, they slept better. They exercised more. Cause and effect, we can infer this. Gratitude makes people healthier. They followed this up with another study with uh, older patients with neuromuscular disease. They found all the same effects. Hours of sleep, again, was different. Wake, wake um, feeling refreshed when you wake was different. This sort of rocked the world, because gratitude's not just about feeling emotionally better, it's about physical health as well. Of course, all kinds of popular media picked this up. Uh, we now know from, from all kinds of studies, there's been, again, hundreds of studies on gratitude. We know it has all kinds of health benefits to be grateful. If you want to live longer, you know, you see the list. You see the list. Don't smoke, sleep well, exercise. Really, there should be gratitude on that list, too. It's a very strong predictor of health benefits. Keep a gratitude journal. Um, and this gets picked up. So if you go to WebMD and look up gratitude, you'll see you can live longer if you're grateful. Uh, there are apps that show you how to sort of become more grateful in life. People put it on their to-do list because now we know that gratitude helps you live longer. Now you start to see where I'm going here. We're back to the big me now, right? Gratitude is suddenly all about me again. It's about how it helps me. And that's where we need this tension. That's where we need the church to remind us that gratitude really isn't about me. Or it's at least not all about me. So the questions I think a faithful Christian would want to ask is, to whom am I grateful? Is, is, if gratitude is a thing, is there someone to whom I'm grateful? And, and if I'm grateful to God, and in fact, Bob Emmons in his latest research is starting to see that 
some of the later things on gratitude aren't having the same effects as the early ones did. And it's probably because it's become the health intervention instead of something that's deeply heartfelt. To whom am I grateful? Uh, there's been some really interesting scholarship in the biblical scholarship world on uh, grace. A guy named John Barclay has written a book called Paul and the Gift, and he talks about grace. And, and, and there's some interesting research starting to come up on the topic of grace and how that's related to gratitude. The church can help us connect those two, grace and gratitude. There, there's this very paradoxical thing about virtue and gratitude and grace because Aristotle, now this was before Christ, so let's, let's hold it lightly, but Aristotle would have said that gratitude is not a virtue because the virtuous person is the giver, the one who gives. And gratitude is about receiving. And grace is about receiving. So there's very, this sort of deeply Christian notion that's really kind of counter-cultural in a sense that virtue begins with receiving more than giving. And the church can help us think that through. It, it, it has interesting implications. Just a, a passage from Colossians 3, which is so much about gratitude. The word gratitude doesn't show up here, but it's so much about gratitude. Since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourself with tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us together in perfect harmony, and let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. For as members of one body, you are called to live in peace. And always be thankful. Let the message about Christ and all its richness fill your lives. Teach and counsel each other with all the wisdom he gives. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. And whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. And may I just, in parentheses, say, this is the way Dallas Willard inspired us to live, is to, to the renovating of the heart, uh, to be a, a heart that leans toward God, that leans toward recognition of God at the center of our lives. And then the third example I want to give of this is humility. Um, I'm going to use a definition that the scientists are using. It's debatable, but I want to use a sort of three-pronged definition of humility. Humility is an accurate view of yourself. It's not a low view of yourself. It's an accurate view of yourself. It is a view that considers the other. It's not the big me. It's not just about me. It, 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 if you have an accurate view of yourself, you can also think about the other. And it is teachable. A humble person is teachable. Well, here's what we know. If you're humble, you're going to have lots of health benefits again, uh, including you're going to be more grateful and more forgiving. We've already talked about those, but you have, strangely, you're going to have better self-esteem. People think if, you're, if you've got a lot of humility, you don't like yourself. You actually have better self-esteem with humility. You're going to be more generous. You have better romantic relationships, less death, less death anxiety, on and on. Lots of benefits to humility. But, we're not all that humble naturally. This is a normal, some of you have taken statistics, you, see, you recognize this normal distribution. What we know based on a normal distribution, 68% of people fall one, or, one standard deviation plus or minus the mean. 16% fall below the mean. 16% fall above the mean. This, I'm not making this up. These are not arbitrary numbers. This is the way a normal distribution works. So that means if you take any trait, like driving ability, if you take a room like this, 68% of us, if we viewed ourselves accurately, 68% of us would say that we are average drivers. 16% of us would say we're below average drivers. 16% of us would say we're above average drivers, if we saw ourselves accurately. The truth is that 93% of us believe that we're above average drivers. <laughs> Statistically impossible. <laughs> 
<coughs> take any sort of positive quality that's been studied, like these here, the average person believes herself or himself to be above average on these qualities. It's the way that we perceive ourselves. We have this sort of positive bias in terms of how we look at ourselves. A million, the Educational Testing Service asks a million high school seniors, compared with others, how well do you get along with your peers? 100% thought that they were average or higher, 60% said they were in the top 10%, and 25% said they were in the top 1% in terms of their ability to get along with peers. Ask college professors, how good are you in the classroom as a teacher? 2% will say they're below average, 10% will say they're average, 63% will say they're above average, and 25% will say they're truly exceptional. Again, statistically impossible. This is not possible, and yet this is the way we perceive ourselves. Fundamental attribution error. Some of you have studied psychology. You, you know that the way this works, if you have, but if something good happens to us, we tend to have internal attributions for it. So you get an A on the test, and you explain that by saying, I studied really hard, I'm smart, I deserve this. Something good happens to someone else, they get the A on the test, and you say, oh, that must have been a really easy test, if you got an A on that test. We have external attributions for successes of others. But when it comes to bad outcomes, we tend to have external explanations for our own, I got a ticket, it's because the police officer had to fill a quota by the end of the month. If something bad happens to someone else, we have internal explanations, like it's sure a good thing we have police officers to keep people like that off the road because they must be a really bad driver. This is the way we naturally think about things. We're not particularly humbled by nature. So what can the church offer? I just have one word, Jesus. And I want to look back to one of the earliest Christology passages, which is this passage in Philippians 2, where Paul writes, if you have any encouragement from being united from, with Christ, if any comfort from His love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself. Not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another have the same attitude of mind Christ Jesus had, who being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing, this theological notion of kenosis. He made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a human, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Karl Barth, uh, the Swiss theologian, looked at this, and he talked about what he called the absurd contrast. We look at Jesus. There's one person who's ever walked the face of the earth who had a right to claim superiority over the rest of us. And what does he do? He makes himself nothing. And what do we do? We think we're pretty special. We're the big me, right? And Bart looks at this and says it's absurd. That contrast, it's absurd. The church can offer us Jesus as that example, that reminder. And by the way, I think it's not coincidental that almost every scientist in the world who's studying humility right now is a Christian. So, positive psychology needs the church to enhance the constructs. And I will move quicker with my last two points, but I think this is so important that we need to sharpen the concepts that are being studied in psychology by thinking about the contributions the church can make. The third one is uh, just to promote faith science dialogue. I, I, um, I notice a number of you in this room are young, so I'm going to make a comment about something I learned at the Templeton Foundation about young people. I may be wrong or right, but here's what I learned. I, I went to a, a meeting that they held in Philadelphia at the Templeton Foundation, and they had a, a world-renowned scientist, a natural scientist, who was talking about faith science dialogue. And he said, the reason we need to care about this is that so many young people are being raised in 
in cultures and in, in, in sort of pockets at least where they where they go to school during the week and they learn that science should be trusted and faith cannot be trusted. They go to church on the weekends and they learn that faith can be trusted and science can't be trusted. And we're not talking to each other. And so what happens is that young people grow up and they feel like they have to make a choice between faith or science when actually that's a completely arbitrary an unnecessary dichotomy. You can hold both, but we have to be able to talk to each other. We have to have faith and science talking together instead of seeing them as, as the opposites. So positive psychology, the science of virtue, is perfect for this because it's the kind of science that already is the topics that the church has been considering for centuries, and we can have that sort of dialogue between faith and science around these topics. So the the science behind the book, The Science of Virtue, we did several different projects using about eight different church congregations. Uh, we did five different projects, all of them doctoral dissertations, where we essentially brought positive psychology into a church community and we wanted to see how it looked. What did it, what did it look like? And so we looked at wisdom and gratitude and grace. These are the three I'm going to talk about tonight. Uh, we also did a humility project. I'm not going to actually talk about that. Uh, and I'm not going to say a ton about wisdom. I'm going to start with wisdom. I'm not going to say a lot about it because that's what I'm going to talk about in chapel tomorrow is, is wisdom. Um, wisdom is such a good topic. I had a student show up in my office uh, maybe seven or eight years ago said, I want to do wisdom for my doctoral dissertation. And I, I said, Paul, that's a great topic, but psychologists don't study wisdom. So he went to, this, to the library and proved me wrong. There's a, there's a rich literature in psychology on wisdom, most of it coming from Berlin, where there's been a lot of study uh, of wisdom. This is one, uh, one graph from one of the studies, which is really fascinating to me. They, they were trying to find exemplars, people who embodied wisdom, and they had these various ways of measuring it, and they actually did it. They found people who, through a kind of complex nomination system that were wiser than the sort of average person on the street. But the thing that's fascinating about this, and, and maybe it's a self-serving bias on the part of the researchers, but even the, even the exemplars of wisdom were no wiser than this, the, the average clinical psychologist they found, which is interesting. And, and, and you could argue that's maybe because of measurement bias or something. I think it's actually because psychologists routinely sit in messy places with people. And I think there's something about getting into the messy places of life that actually can help promote wisdom. And, and what a beautiful place to think about wisdom and in terms of faith science dialogue in the church. So that's what we did. We had one church congregation where we had two different groups. We had a wisdom co uh, cohort and then we had a comparison group. And we measured them at two different times. And in, in between, the wisdom cohort met with wisdom mentors in this church. We identified, the pastors helped us. We identified sort of older, by the way, I'll talk about this a little bit in chapel. You don't actually have to be old to be wise. If you look at the data on this, um, we always assume that the older you get, the wiser you get. That's not what the data show. Um, it's interesting. But in this case, we used older wisdom mentors, and they met in small groups with these um, college-age students. And we measured some things at time one and time two, and we found uh, that they met twice twice monthly, and, and they got messy. I mean, like the first week, the first thing they came in with, the students were faced with a scenario where their friend, you know, hypothetical scenario, but their friend's just been diagnosed with cancer. And the, their friend is starting to question faith. And, and you, as, as that person's friend, you're also starting to hold some questions about faith. And what do you do? What's the wise response? And, and our mentors did not answer that. It was a time where they engaged in some spiritual practices of silence and, and scripture, and, 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 and it was a spiritual process of sitting with the messiness of life. And what we found at the end of the time is that uh, life satisfaction was higher in the wisdom group. Now, you could argue that any group would do that. Um, we found that practical wisdom, we had a scale that's been established that measures practical wisdom. We found that increased in the wisdom group as compared to the comparison. The thing that was really interesting was this 
uh, and this doesn't look like a large effect, but it was statistically significant, this notion of post-formal thought, being able to, to handle ambiguity or uncertainty, things that aren't really clear in life, being able to tolerate the mess, was higher in the group that had gone through the wisdom mentoring. And also this idea that there might be multiple ways to look at a thing. Now this, this is kind of weird, that increased in the, uh, in the wisdom group, it went way down in the comparison group. I have no clue what that's about. But we saw um, these several pretty striking effects of wisdom mentoring. And more importantly, it got the church and the scientists talking together. And we got this dialogue going. We've had several churches since ask for the curriculum and, and they're using the same program in their churches. And, and it's getting the dialogue going. Can we talk science? Can we talk faith? Can we talk about them in the same sentence and together? Uh, that's if, if anyone wants any more. You can email me. I can send you the slides. We have a journal article describing this. In, uh, in the second study, we did gratitude. And we had two different congregations involved in this study. In the first half of the study, Congregation 1 went through a gratitude campaign where they were really emphasizing gratitude. We call it a gratitude blitz. They had a sermon series and the small group conversations. They read a book together. They did weekly gratitude exercises. Uh, then at the midpoint in the study, the, the two congregations crossed over and the second congregation did the gratitude emphasis and the first one went back to ministry as usual, which I hope still involves some gratitude. Um, this is what we expected to find. We expected that the congregation one would show increases uh, in gratitude and other measures um, during their gratitude campaign and that the congregation two would show increases in their gratitude during this their gratitude campaign what we found was kind of odd it's like both congregations just went up the whole time and and we don't know exactly what that means but one of the interesting things is there was a striking ceiling effect so that people even that before the study started people were so high on gratitude it was kind of hard to measure much change and so from that, we think probably churchgoers are just pretty grateful people. You know the people who go to church? This is a little-known finding. If you look in, a, in some old demographic study about 15 years ago, people who go to church live on the average nine years longer than those who don't. Even after you remove sort of some of the behavioral implications like smoking and drinking, they still live significantly longer than people who don't go to church. Maybe, who knows, maybe part of that has to do with just the gratitude that comes with being a churchgoer. Um, if there was anything else that improved our health by nine years, you'd see it all over the media, right? But this is kind of one of those hidden findings we don't see very much. But again, the, the goal is to get science and faith talking together. Uh, and then the final one is we looked at grace, the same design. We had a grace blitz. We did this in um, two different congregations. And we wanted to see, does grace help self-forgiveness? And in fact, we found it did. Just as we expected in the first congregation, when there was a grace emphasis, we found people became more forgiving of themselves. And in the second congregation, when they had their grace emphasis, they became more self-forgiving. So again, the point here is just to get faith and science talking together. It's not so much to show you the numbers, but it's, it's that dialogue that becomes important. And it's why the church and positive psychology can work together. And then the fourth thing, and, and I, I talked to uh, a lot of people who are counselors and psychologists, and I, I'm guessing a few of you might be psychology majors. I'm going to hit this point very lightly. But I think the science of virtue can help inform how we sit with people in our clinical offices. I must have a little bit of an obsession with table games, because I, I, I'm going to mention um, this idea I have. It's apparently a bad idea, but it's an idea for a table game. I gave this to a group of about 5,000 people a year ago, and nobody has done it, so I'm guessing it's a really bad idea. But here's my idea. To get from point A to point B on this table game, you have to be able to guess what the acronym means. And there'll be different card sets. So for counselors and psychologists, there'll be a bunch of acronyms. And you, to, get, to move forward, you have to be able to sort of know what the acronym is, or else to be able to fool people into thinking you know what the acronym is, right? These are all acronyms. If you're a psychology major, you probably know a bunch of them. If you're a psychologist like me, you probably know all of them. 
The name of this card set is CHATNA, which stands for Counselors Have Too Many Acronyms. <laughs> um, I'm going to give you one more. It's PPIs, Positive Psychology Interventions. This is a new thing. It just started in the last decade. And it's taking this academic world of positive psychology and saying, can we make a difference in terms of our counseling and our psychotherapy work? And there's lots of different ways people are doing it, including gratitude interventions, empathy-based, meaning-oriented ones. You can see forgiveness interventions. But what I want to suggest, and I'm going to, again, I'm going to move pretty quickly, hit this lightly. What I want to suggest is that there are two different ways to look at this, one of them less interesting than the other. This is the way I think is sort of fairly uninteresting, which is to take this as scientists do and say, are they effective? Do they work? And, and let me make a case for why it's sort of ineffective. So, so what we do in science is we take some scale, we measure well-being in some ways, and we have some intervention, and then we have, at the end of the intervention, we have some other way of, we have the same way of measuring it a, a second time. And then we take that and we compare it to a wait list. It's very similar to the church-based interventions I was just showing you. So in this case, we would take positive psychology interventions, those would sort of be what we would do in between our measures of well-being. But I end up with lots of questions, and you may too. One is, to what extent do the scales that we're using really measure this sort of telos, this sort of rich, full-bodied, virtuous sense of what it means to be fully human? And then the second question I have is, when we take an intervention, any intervention in psychology, and we study it scientifically, we tend to sort of scrub it down, make it really pristine so we can study, we manualize it. Is that really the intervention still, or have we made it so clean that we've actually taken the richness of the intervention away? So gratitude's a good example. There's just a meta-analysis on gratitude. I showed you some of that really dramatic findings in that 2003 study. Back in that study, they were showing these large, what we call effect size, a, a 0.8 effect size of very large. It's, you, you throw a party. If you ever get a 0.8 effect size, it's a huge effect size. And that's what they found in the early studies. But when you actually look at gratitude interventions, because now it's being studied all the time, and we're thinking about a health, a health benefit and so forth, the actual studies show that uh, the effect sizes are down to 0.4. If you, if you compare it with a Hassel's group, if you compare it with nothing at all, it's down to 0.2, which is a really small intervention. And that's looking at gratitude as the outcome. Nobody comes to counseling because they want to be more grateful. They come to counseling because they're anxious or they're depressed. So if you look at anxiety <coughs> as the outcome, it's even smaller. It's almost, gratitude is almost non, I mean, a li it's a little effective, but it's not very effective at all. So I'm not that interested in this first one. I, I, I think we're kind of asking the wrong question. The question that I think is much more interesting is how might virtue enhance the goals and process of psychotherapy and the person of psychotherapy, not just these sort of measures we have for outcome. I was, I was talking about gratitude with a group of, of postdocs and doctoral students, and, and, and I said, have you ever tried gratitude in counseling? And two people raised their hand and said, yes, I have. And one said, it was, it was okay, it worked kind of okay. And the second person raised their hand and had just raved, just raved about how helpful it had been to her client. The thing is, I knew these two students. One of them is a person who lived in deep gratitude for life, and she was the one who had that really positive outcome. The other one, good student, but not particularly a grateful person, I wouldn't say. She's the one that had sort of the mediocre outfit. Or out, outcome in therapy. So I'm wondering, might it be that, that, that the person of the psychologist, the, or the counselor, might, might we think of virtue, um, these are the questions I would ask, but might, here's the question I think, to what extent does virtue development in the psychotherapist and the counselor affect the treatment process and outcome? The, the telos of the person in the room I think that might be really fascinating and really important to, to think about in those terms. I hit that one lightly. I've talked a long time. We wanted to leave some time for questions or comments. Um, so we have. We have a little bit of time. So questions, comments, <coughs> thoughts, arguments. Just to start things off and break gas, let me ask. Um, suppose, a, imagine a Westmont student can, 
uh, and a psych major, and thinks, this is really interesting. I've never heard of this before. I want to study this. Um, what's the next step? Besides reading your book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that's interesting. Positive psychology is new enough that I don't think you can go get a PhD in positive psychology. Maybe um, there might be places like University of Pennsylvania, there might be enough of an emphasis that you could go and get something close to a PhD in positive psychology. But more it would have to be like a research or especially research interest you would get in a, in a general PhD program or a master's program and you'd take it on as your, your master's or your, or your doctoral thesis work. It's getting popular. We have, at George Fox, we now have an undergraduate course in positive psychology. I think there are a number of schools that are starting to sort of develop courses. But it's new enough that it's not mainstream yet. We're not, we're not seeing it every, in every curriculum. I, and I might be wrong. I haven't looked recently. There may be places where you can go get PhDs in this, but I, I just am not aware of it. It's great. Other questions, comments? Yeah. Um, you mentioned about the people um, overrating their their own good response to things. Um, if you wanted to be have a better outcome of reality, are there ways that you can get someone else close to the person to give a, an answer to evaluate? Yeah. So great question. Uh, imagine this from a science perspective. So we want to come up with a scale of humility. How are we going to do that? We're going to ask people to, to self-report how humble they are. Yeah. And, and this is actually one of the big problems with the science of humility, because people will consistently say, oh yes, I'm very humble. Because that's what we do. We, over, we overestimate ourselves. So what they, what um, the John Templeton Foundation funded a number of studies, and, and it's still, you know, it's still not perfect, but it's a much better system of assessing than we used to have. And it is based exactly as you say, by getting other people to rate you. So, like, what would your mother say about you? Is, uh, that may not be a great example, but what would your friends say about you? So, um, so that sort of other report and self-report. Some of the initial studies, if you know correlation coefficients, we're showing about a 0.2 correlation between self-report and other report, which is a very low correlation. It's sort of like saying there's almost no relationship between how we perceive ourselves and how others perceive us. Um, but they've made it a lot better over the course of, of, of a number of studies and, uh, they, they're, they're, and actually they're subdividing humility into different topics. So like there's cultural humility and intellectual humility and relational humility. Uh, and these seem to be gaining some traction and they're coming up with better measurement tools. I still think, and we've talked, some of us were talking at lunch about this, this is one of the weaknesses of psychology in general is we have to measure everything and I think the philosophers don't have to do that. And, and, and my guess is if Dallas Willard were here, he would be squirming a little bit about my talk about measuring things. Because you just can't measure a thing as well as you can think about a thing. So, so the philosophers are looking more richly and more deeply at these concepts than we are able to as social scientists. Because we have to measure it. And, and I don't think we do it very well yet. We do it better than nothing, but not very well yet. Yeah. There's a, a recent book by Rebecca de Young called Glittering Vices. And it's not so much a scientific study as looking at the church's view over history, but it does kind of go into a bunch of it. Is there, I mean, is there any kind of connection between the science of virtue and the science of vices? Science of vice, wow. I mean, you know, and sort of, this is practicing good things the other might be avoiding bad things, but uh, does that does, does the flip side of this enter into it at all? That's a wonderful question. I, I don't know of any psychologists who are looking at that. It, I was talking about how forgiveness, the idea of being forgiven doesn't gain much traction in the psychology literature. Even less is the notion of sin or vice. It's like nobody wants to talk about that. So I've seen very little on that. I've actually written a little bit on sin and grace and find that it's very hard to talk about with psychologists. They just don't want to talk about that. Even the notion of 
a fundamental fault in a human person is sort of distasteful to a lot of psychologists. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I think no, I think I can't be very helpful in that. But, but I, it would, wouldn't it be wonderful if we lived in a world where you could study that sort of honestly and and, and look at those things? And I don't think we live in that world, at least not right now. But I'm really glad, I don't know the Rebecca de Young book you mentioned, I'm really glad people are thinking and writing about this, even if the scientists aren't looking at it. She's at Calvin. Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, thinking about the first uh, point that you had on the board, um, I was thinking, uh, I feel like focusing more on eulogy virtues, such mm -hmm. as like contentness, um, would, they would be kind of, those kind of people who would focus on their, if like a mass amount decided that they were going to focus more on eulogy values, I feel like they'd be kind of left behind by the people who focus more on achievement and um, resume virtues, so, such as like technological um, achievements yeah. and societal achievements or progression. Um, I don't know how that would play out. But that's what I was, what I was thinking. I didn't know what you had to say. I, that's an excellent observation. You would absolutely be left behind. And, and, that's, and this is why I think McIntyre's point is this is not like an individual choice. It's not like you can sort of listen to a lecture like this and say, I'm going to start thinking about eulogy virtues now. I'm going to change the way I live. Because we live in a system that doesn't think like that. So you absolutely would be left behind. It's a critique of our whole system, not an individual in, in, in that regard. So I think it's a really important point. I, I was re reading the um, sort of summary of, of Blake Nordstrom's life, uh, who died suddenly at age 58. And I, uh, um, it was touching and it was beautiful, but it was all resume virtues. Everything that was being used to describe his life was about who he was as a leader, as a, as a board chairman of Nordstrom and so forth. That's just the world we live in. And Mac, McIntyre would critique that and say, we can't really understand virtue, we can't really understand telos, because that's the world we live in. Mm -hmm. So the question of the point number one here is, can we start inching toward a new vocabulary? Who knows how many generations it will take, but can we start moving toward a new vocabulary where we reclaim this other way of looking at things? It's going to take a long time if we can do that. Yeah. Um, when you were getting your um, PhD in psychology, did you have more doubts about Christianity? Uh, no. <laughs> were they right? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't. I, I mean, I see that in my students at a Christian university. I see them really struggling sometimes with faith. Um, to me, the world's just made sense together. I, 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 and, and maybe I'm unusual or weird or something, but to me, uh, I, I often will tell my students that good integration means mutual transformation, that it means my theology will change my psychology. But it also means my psychology is likely to change my theology some. And I just have been, I just sort of gone with that. I've sort of let my psychology influence the way I understand God's presence in the world. But I've also let that change the way I do psychology, and I've loved it. It's just been a, just a beautiful, wonderful journey for me. Um, but I know some people have really struggled in that. It's, for me, it's just been rewarding and fun. Ah, thank you for that question. Oh. Uh, real quick, I, re I really appreciated your mention of kenosis with regards to humility. But could you, could you maybe briefly just explain or um, expand on this idea of how that specific action of kenosis is enacted by, by Jesus, kind of how does that inform our conception or, um, or, or how we carry out humility? Yeah, words? yeah. Are you a theology no, uh, no, student? No, no. Okay, because it's a really important point, and I'm not a theologian, I'm not a philosopher, so I'll stumble through this, but I, but I also want to mention that John 1, 14 passage, which is in some ways... I mean, you look through John chapter 1, this beautiful passage of the, the eternal word who then becomes flesh and dwells among us. And you see this great self-emptying of Christ. A lot of people will take the Philippians 2 passage and see it as one of the very first 
works of Christology, from trying to work out, this is what the, the early church did for four or five hundred years, is to work out who was Jesus in, in, in his humanity, in his divinity, who was Jesus. And here we see Paul doing it in the New Testament, and this notion that, that Christ, fully divine, would empty himself of that privilege. Um, I mean, not, not his divinity, he didn't give up his divinity, but he gave up the privileges associated with that divinity to be born in a smelly barn in Bethlehem. You know, the Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox Church really sees the incarnation like Protestants, like we Protestants see Easter. They see that as the sort of the salvific importance of that moment. And, and, and it is, it's, it's just really striking to think that God would show up in that barn and I, I'm building a goat barn. I, I, it's a messy place. Barns are messy places and that the, the God of the universe would show up. That's incredible self emptying That's incredible humility. And, and that's what the church can offer us as we think about humility, is, 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 is a God who would do something like that. It's remarkable. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for a very much needed lecture. Um, uh, throughout the entire lecture, you kept mentioning how um, we humans, um, it's really easy, even when you're being virtuous, to just do it because it benefits us. And that's what science has been focusing on. And, um, and you kept mentioning how this culture we live in um, kind of encourages that. And so as Christians and scientists, uh, I am a very chemist, so, uh, how do you deal with that? How do you reconcile that in your everyday life? Like, yeah. how, do you, how do you become virtuous for, because you know, God has been gracious and you know, merciful toward you and still like, manage to do it, not just because it benefits you, but mm -hmm. because uh, mm -hmm. you know, like, how do you do with that? I had a colleague ask me when this book came out, she said, how, how does it feel to know that you wrote the book on virtue? And I just hated the question because I thought, I'm, I'm not that virtuous, okay? I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I would love to be, but it's not like something I want to hold myself out as, this, as a role model for virtue. Um, but I love your question. And, and, and here's my, my, my kind of off the top of my head answer. I, if I thought about it today, I might have a little better one. But I'm not too bothered by a self-interested look at virtue because it at least still moves a person toward forgiveness or gratitude or humility. I just want us to think beyond that. So, so yeah, for, if, if for no other reason, forgive because it helps you get on with your life. That's a, still a beautiful thing. It's a good thing. But let's try to remember. Let's try to hold on to the possibility that there are other reasons too. So I think I, I think I want to say accept that we are self-interested people. Let that be a driver for our virtue. But let's not let it be the only thing. Let's try to remember, and, and that's where I think the church has such a striking voice here. Let it, let's remember that there's love of God and, and neighbor also. And yeah, I think we probably ought to wrap it up with that and oh, one more maybe one more question I think for me I kind of struggle is like how does the church become more open to science because it seems like it's more of the church's problem embracing science more than science embracing theology and philosophy and all that good stuff so I think sometimes it's like hard to go to a church that maybe like the pastor might be open to it, but the congregation mm -hmm, mm -hmm. might not be open mm -hmm. to that. That's just how I viewed it from my experience. Yeah. Because, you know, so, so I just feel like, like, from your experience as a psychologist, have you dealt with, like, different churches and their attitudes, like, just in their doctoral things about their own openness versus, you know, to maybe some of the things that you research and stuff. 
I'm just asking you, like, how did you, okay. like, successfully try and change their mindsets to where it's like, okay, it's not just an individual level, it's more like a corporate level. Can I ask you the kind of question that a speaker should never ask someone who's, and, and that is, how old are you? <laughs> I'm 20. <laughs> okay, so I was 21, 22, I was 22 in 1980 when the psycho psychologists and religion just weren't getting along at all. And, over, and I'm 60 now, and over the course of 38 years, I've seen this amazing change. Now, I'm not taking credit for it. If anything, I've been a tiny little part of that. But here's my word to you. Be part of a generation that changes this. You have this passion, this vision for better dialogue in the church and between church and science. If a bunch of people believe that, you can change this. This can, this can be better in 38 years than it is now. Uh, but what we need is people who have that vision, who are willing to move forward and say, let's talk. Let, let's not just make enemies out of each other, let's talk. Let's really have, let's sit down and have real conversation and see what we can learn from science and what we can learn from faith. So I'm not going to answer your question. I'm just going to sort of challenge you to take it on. And, 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 and I think if, if, if your generation takes it on, it will change. Thank you all. It's been a really pleasure.